Hello, this is before the fire. You need to learn how to make it before you put it in the kiln. And I'm going to try and help you out with a few techniques revolving around slump molding. I am Professor Stephen Robinson, and I hope you enjoy this demonstration. Any questions, please let me know. This assignment, you're going to be thinking about using slump molding. And slump molding is a pretty simple process. Um, it's something that you complicate quite a bit too, and so there will be other demonstrations relevant to this technique as you move down the line. But in the beginning, you just think, uh, what is slump molding? Um, hump molding and slump molding are two ways to work with kind of a simple way of making a form. And again, you can complicate both of them. So um, for slump molding, there's a variety of different ways to approach it. One is a found object that happens to have a negative space. We're always gonna deal with this negative space of a mold. Um, and so it depends on what you're making. Um, is it representational? Can the negative space be something like a rabbit? Um, or can the negative space again be a found object? So this tube just has this negative space where the clay can slump down into it. And this can be done on virtually any scale, you know, maybe this big and bigger. So larger objects that you can use, you start, you start seeing things that have this negative space. The best material, it, it all depends, like free, that's the best material. So like cardboard, a cardboard box, um, you know you order things, you get these boxes. The quality of the cardboard is important. The scale of the object that you make, sometimes cardboard isn't going to work. And I'll talk about that further on down the line here. Uh, but, you know, anything like maybe this big cardboard works pretty well. And there's ways to use cardboard for um, larger things, but I'm not going to get into that right now. So cardboard for... Uh, this assignment, your your scale is about here, and cardboard is going to work great, it, and it cuts easy. That's the cool thing. So cardboard cuts with something uh, as simple as an X-Acto knife, and I would suggest having a brand new blade for it. Um, the idea uh, that you're going to look at, if you're going to make a bowl with this technique, you would think about a bowl shape, is a bowl always round? Can it be an oval bowl? Can it be a, a certain shape? I did something really ridiculous. I made this shape. I drew with a Sharpie and I'm going to do this really long asparagus serving bowl. How about that? So what 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 you're going to use the bowl for could come, sometimes dictate that shape. Um, uh, I'm also going to discuss how uh, you're gonna make feet for these bowls. Getting the material is where you start. You go and get some cardboard. You, I've told you if you ordered something, uh, maybe save the box. Cardboard that doesn't work, you can think about cardboard that doesn't work um, is shiny cardboard. Any cardboard that has like real shiny surface. So these brown cardboard's the best, okay? As you get up in scale, um, there's also this stuff called polystyrene. Now, cutting this stuff, uh, there's MSDS sheets on it, too. I want you to be aware of uh, safety issues around polystyrene. And it's something that costs money to buy, all right? You would use a saber saw or a handheld jigsaw to cut it. Um, you can use saw blades, too, but um, it, it's best to use a jigsaw. The next step up, if you go large, I've done la large pieces that have been four and five feet, uh, not really large, but large pieces with this, and I've used plywood for that. So I've used plywood for that because cardboard, if you do, a, and this is, a, uh, this is something my son's doing, a, a painting. I'm a 12-year-old right now who's doing these big paintings, and he's using this as a stencil, but... Um, 
you see how flimsy it is, especially with like an appendage like this. So uh, that's why if you go to a larger scale, you would think about using a harder material. Of course, that makes it harder to cut. Yeah. On certain scales, like this is a pretty large serving tray slash bowl. Uh, you can use polystyrene and that's easier to cut and cheaper. Um, every material you have, you have to think about safety though. So how do we cut the cardboard? It seems really like, well, you just cut it with an X-Acto knife. You cut, cut. You don't saw because it can ruin the integrity. And so that's one thing. And you don't expect to cut through, even if you have a brand new blade, you're not gonna cut through the cardboard right away. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over this line and over this line and over this line until I get through it. Right. So I'm gonna go over the line, over the line, and I keep doing that until I cut through it. I'm gonna put it down on the table so I don't hold it up in the air like this. And I'm gonna do that. Okay, so I've cut through it all the way and it pops out. Sometimes it's a little stuck and you gotta pop it. So this is gonna be a shape that I am going to slump into a elongated tray. Um, I will show you the different stages as we go. How do I know how close to the edge I can come? That's one question you want to put in your head right now. I would say that I did this one a little close to the edge. You want to have it about an inch and a half or two inches away from the edge of the cardboard. You're also going to want to make it with a box. You want to hang it up. If you use just a sheet of uh, cardboard by itself with it not being a box, you can get away with that. And you may have to hang it up on a bucket or something so you can slump down into it. So you need this space to get the clay to drape down in or slump down in there, okay? So those are some questions that may come up. It's like, where, how much of this cardboard I can use? Make sure you're about two inches from the edge so you find the box that you need. So what I would say is maybe that is a good size distance. So it'll hold it up. So, you know, what's cool about a box is it's got so many sides you can use. For instance, this box has several different shapes on it. There's another box with a bunch of different shapes. It's kind of like the one you played with as a kid. Put your right shape in the right hole, right? So thinking about using your box or getting a variety of boxes to get the pieces you want out of this assignment, that's your job. So I've discussed additive, subtractive, and expansive techniques. I'm gonna show you all of those a variety of different ways. The expansive techniques, you can use your fingers and flexible ribs or non-flexible ribs, and you'd be pushing from the inside to the out. Compressing it down from the outside is another way to work with that technique. But if you're doing reductive technique, you know a sharp stick works really well. You can carve into it. You can also lay the stick on it and push a line that's really straight, as straight as the stick is. Push a line into it. Or even rock a rib onto the surface to create a line. But when you're doing reductive work, these are called loop tools and you see a really small one so small that the camera won't even focus. This one here is a Kemper product. This one here, I have no idea. One of my students gave it to me. It's so small. You can make them too. This is a Dolan tool. And so you can think of them as your trimming tools too when you're throwing. But these are all loop tools. You can get a whole kit of these different shapes. Let me try and see that weird shape. Um, but again, a sharp stick works really good. You can pick at the clay, you can again drag the clay. There are different ways to do reductive work. You can use your wire tool, I think I've discussed that already, where you drag it through to cut stuff off or a cheese cutter. So how do you reduce it and work the surface? Additive techniques, you would just roll out slabs at 
different thicknesses or pinch forms or slump forms or when you get to a wheel throw little elements those are additive techniques there's a variety of different ways to add things You know how to roll a slab now. And one thing that you have sometimes are these imperfections. You may have used a canvas board or your wooden board might have some texture on it or yet, you, you know, you dented or something like that. These areas here can be erased and you can use uh, a drywall knife like this or something to cut in for painting. These work really well, but what you do have are the ribs in your toolkit. The wooden one doesn't work too well, but the metal one does. So I'll use the metal one and show you what the I The metal mean. rib, you wanna be careful not to press down too hard because if you're using the curvature, you might put a curvature in it. But you just kinda of sled across the surface and you can slowly smooth out that surface before you go to use it. So you're cleaning it off. now. Again, if you look at a tool like this, it takes it all in one swipe. And it's a little quicker. So even though this side is nice and smooth, maybe the other side isn't. We gotta be careful when we pick up a slab. And you can look at that. I put it right back on a wet surface. Now normally, I would tell you, don't do that. Move it to a drier surface on your board. Of course, your board has a texture, so when I go and do the other side, sometimes it picks up that texture. You see that little line that came up there? That's because I'm not cleaning my tool. So I wanna clean this tool, get that surface all cleaned off. And if I go over it now, I won't mess it up. Now, the MDF that this table is made out of doesn't have a texture, so it's a good source. You have this cutout from that mold that you made. This can be a template to decide how much clay you need. This seems like a little bit too much, but it's nice to have edges to lift up on. I wouldn't go much more than two or three inches larger than this. Otherwise, it might be unmanageable for you right now. So maybe two or three inches all the way around would be a good one to think about because you can lift up on those edges and kind of, you'll manhandle them a little bit. And I'll show you what I mean. Okay, we have our mold here. Like I said, you wanna lift up the clay carefully. You can lay it on top of that. Lifting on those edges, it naturally starts slumping down into that negative space because there's nothing to hold it up. If it's a larger piece, you gotta be careful so it doesn't slip right down through it. So you do want to think about that. After I get it close to where I want it by doing this, I might then take the edges. And again, I'm see I'm, if you can see, I'm just holding the edge of it. I'm not going to touch it where it, it's going in there as much, okay? I might take those edges and then lay them down slightly. Um, if I'm going to use a lip on it, maybe I, I'd be you know, a little more careful with that. And maybe I'll put a lip on this just to show you what it mean. So after that, that's that's slumped already. You see the space here is about, so it's about that deep. So it's about an inch and a half to two inches deep, okay? If we want to coerce it in there further, we use a dry sponge and see how there's a curvature on this sponge. You can actually use the curve and you go bop, 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 And you can just kind of bounce a dry sponge in there. I have known people who use um, pantyhose filled with sand because it disperses the weight even as you kind of drop it in there and it evenly disperses that weight. Now, another thing is the expansive technique of using a rib. Now, this rib's kind of large for this, but I could put it this way and I can gently push it in. Now that sometimes um, messes it up more than helps it at this stage because the clay is rather wet. And 
And then there's my finger, which also can mess it up at this stage because the clay is rather wet. But I can sled my finger around in there and kind of start working that. If I know that I want it this area of the form, if you remember how this form is, it has this curve and this curve. If I wanted those areas a little bit more slumped, I can gently use my hand to have that happen. After I've gotten it all smoothed out as best as I can, I can think about cutting the lip right now. If it's a larger one, that's what I would suggest. Because um, I can work the edge of the lip while it's still hanging up on the cardboard here without manipulating the lip. If it's maybe this size, maybe I can um, slump it back out of the form right away. If it's any bigger than this, if I do that, it might cave back in. So all this curvature I just got might be gone. Uh, on larger forms, sometimes I want to get it out of there sooner and I'll pack it full of plastic because I won't care about the inside as much, but you should try and care about the inside. So for bowls, if you're doing bowls with this, I would really care about the inside. Any serving area, uh, you want it nice and smooth. Um, so I'd probably flip it out of there now or maybe in about half an hour. Let it stiffen up. The problems you run into sometimes are around these edges where you've maybe pushed too far on the cardboard and it's hung up. So you want to like kind of gently lift those edges a little, make sure they're released. You'll get a sense if it's stuck to that or not um, before I flip it out. Now let me show you how you flip it out. You need to have a board, preferably one that's a nice smooth surface board, and you put it on top of it gently. And you're going to grab it, and you're just going to kind of sandwich it, but don't push down too hard on the board. And you're going to gently, gently, gently flip it over. If you waited for a little while, like maybe a half hour or so, you still want to be gentle. Um, but if you did it right away, like I did here, you want to be careful. And you lift the box off, and you can see what you got now. And this will tell you a variety of things. There'll be some areas that you may even put it back in the mold to get more out of. Uh, there'll be some areas like this right in here that I might want to smooth out before it dries up too much. And I can use my finger to smooth it out. Um, and now it's a choice whether I have a nice rim around this. Now I see the line that the mold made and I can measure and I can follow that line. And I can slowly cut a rim that mimics the actual shape or I can cut a rim that augments the actual shape. These are some choices for you to make. How you cut it would be a fettling knife. If you use your X-Acto knife, that works well. If you use your needle tool, it doesn't work well. But a, a metal fettling knife like this, I'm gonna cut it all the way, try and get a fluid line. And I'm also trying to keep the fettling knife straight up and down as I do it. I might stop there because it's hard for me to get that curve. And I'm going to be in the way here, but I'm going to... And while I'm doing this, I'll talk about feet. So I'm cutting this and thinking about where would I put feet on here? Okay, I've cut it all the way now. I'm going to slowly peel that away. And try not to drop it on there. This is wet right out of the mold. So I wouldn't be adding 
any feet. If I'm going to do a big slump molded foot form for this piece right here, I'm going to add it maybe right here. If I push down on it right now, it'll collapse this form. So I'm going to let it get to a stage called cheese hard or leather hard. But before that, these edges can be worked on this side. Then I only have one edge to work later. So I'm going to work these edges by just taking a damp, but not wet. Do, do not make it wet and don't have a dry thumb. And I'm going to smooth that edge out and work that really gently till I round out that corner. One of the worst things you can do, and I'm gonna talk about that each time, is, is not think about your edges. If you have a freshly cut edge and you haven't smoothed it out and worked it, it's as though you didn't care. So take some care and take care of those edges. You can have sharp edges, I just, um, I'm just going to say, as a utilitarian object, that's where it can chip. And also, it just isn't comfortable in the hands. So, And this is something that you would hold. You would bring to the table and, and hold uh, on the way to the table. And maybe those edges wouldn't be comfortable. Well, the next step will be to show you how to make a hollow form for a foot. If you're going to do a hollow foot, you're going to have to think about asymmetrical or symmetrical form. And if you do a hollow foot with this technique, you're going to have to make two parts. I'm, that's what I'm going to do for this demonstration. But feasibly, I could just use this for one foot and that for the other foot. And they sit and they'd be attached to that bowl form. The bowl form would go up here. So they would sit flat. I'm going to have this flattened out, but I'm also going to attach this to that first form I made. So symmetry is really important if you're going to do a hollow foot. And let me show you the mold. So if the mold is a symmetrical form, so the same on both sides like that, you only need to slump in this side. If it's asymmetrical like this, you see how this is different here? in there. Then I have to slump in this side and then flip it over and slump the other side or I make two molds. So here's one side and if you notice on this one that longer part is on the other side. You see the, you see that these would then come together. Another thing you need to think about is how much edge you leave. You do not want to cut it so close like I did right here. If I cut it that close, that edge is drying out. The whole time I'm trying to get this dry out so I can put it together without manipulating it, that edge will dry out first. So about a pencil thickness or a little more is what I would suggest. We want to conserve on our clay. So about a quarter inch or a little bit more. And then when you go to cut it, be cutting this edge right here so it works so it fits onto that one then when you cut it you have a fresh edge to score and slip and you can put these two pieces together if it had been drying out the whole time that these were drying out then that edge over here that didn't have extra clay I just smushed it off to show you this as an example that edge would be too dry to score and slip, and you would have a crack in that area on the form. So please pay attention to that. As you can see, I've cut this apart. It took about a half hour to 45 minutes to get it so it was stiff enough that I didn't manipulate it. You may take a little longer. If you are over manipulating your forms, they may be too wet, but not much more than 40 minutes. And it all depends. If you put it in the sun, of course, it will dry quicker. I'm going to score and slip these edges of these two pieces and put those together to make this hollow form for the foot. But I have talked about conserving your clay and being cautious not to waste it. 
So even these scraps, what I'm going to suggest is have a separate bag for gooey clay. You can dip these in water and throw it in that bag. And all your scraps, you can do that with. And eventually, you'll have a big gooey bag of clay. And I'll discuss how to dry that out. If you do that, let me know. And I'll teach you how to do that. Okay, I have it all put together. And I've wiped away some of the slip that squirted out. Now, to manipulate this seam, um, I'm going to do some fettling with my fettle knife or sledding with a flexible rubber, plastic, or metal rib. And if you go and just take that seam and you fettle it out, you can smooth this out. Now, a curvature on a piece, you might use the curvature of the rib. So if I go and take this rib, this is the one that comes in your toolkit, so I might as well use that, right? and I curve it around the form, you can see how that starts to manipulate it. Now, no water. Don't use water. Move the clay. So you see this seam is almost fixed compared to this is still needing to be worked. So you need to work those joints. So these seams on this side I already worked to some degree, and I'm going to play with this a little bit more. And then this form is then going to become this foot underneath that asparagus bowl or tray. As I'm manipulating this, I have put that other form out in the sun. I'm going to check that every five minutes. Set your time every five minutes. Go check it. If you're going to use the sun, it can dry it out so fast. So make sure you check it. And... Every five minutes ought to be good for you to check it to get to a point where it gets close to this state of cheese hard. I got it pretty smoothed out and pretty much close to completion. I have this form now. Now, you don't see a hole in it, do you? So the whole time, there's been air in there, and I've been pushing against it, manipulating it very gently and sledding it. Because um, this is kind of a wet side of leather hard. I want to be really careful to not smoosh it. But um, what I do now after I feel like it's close to ready uh, and I'm close to finished and refined, I do want to put a hole in it somewhere to make sure when it starts to dry to get to that harder leather hard where I can score and put it onto the bottom as a foot that it allows the air to come out. So make sure after you get close, if you do any hollow feet like this, you need to put um, just a needle to a hole in it. That's all you need to do. Okay. Once you have it um, at a point where you can handle it without manipulating it too much, so that leather hard stage or a little wetter. Um, so I'm going to show you what I've been doing. I like thinking about where it's going to go. As far as, again, you're looking at this upside down. I've actually done some reductive sort of work where I've laid a line on there. And uh, I'm going to probably do some lines on this too. And then I'll score and I'll slip and I'll put it together. But I have not, you see the curvature on this is still there. And I haven't manipulated it at all because I've been working with it at this stage. So it is a little wetter than maybe how you would work, but I wanted to manipulate it a little. So that's my next step is probably put some lines on here similar to the lines here. So it ties in a little bit and then I'll score and slip and I'll put it together. But I will not flip it over till it's really hard. Remember I said a hollow object needs a hole? If I score and slip that, put that on, that hole will be covered up. So I need to find another place to put a hole. So the benefit of this being a hollow object is I could pierce it, I could carve into it where you go all the way through it. It's called piercing. I could have this negative space be a really dark area on there. Different ways to approach it. Or I could have just leave it as this kind of puffy cloud form too. So maybe I'll do a little bit of both and I'll, I'll try and eliminate that. Okay, so I slipped and scored. And I did a little bit of line work on it. Of course, I did put a hole in it. 
um, to get into that joint where it comes together to score and slip, you get slip that squishes out and you want to erase some of that slip. And the only way I've found that really works well is a stiff paintbrush like that. Using a stiff paintbrush, like this one here, you can get it a little moist like your finger and you can get into areas that you can't get into with your finger. Uh, of course, I'm not going to flip it over quite yet. Still do not want to concave the shape of that elongated bowl form. So I want to let it stiffen up a little bit more. And I would say on a day like today, which is what you're going to be dealing with most of the time, springtime day, maybe in about an hour or two, you still want to be careful when you flip it over. So with this example, you can see how it's pushed out of the format of just a typical round bowl, of course. You see the detail of where that comes together. That could join up or look like two separate forms as I did it. You can think about different ways to approach that. The edges I decided to kind of square off and fold up a little. I'll show you a few more ways to play with the idea of the foot instead of a hollow and closed form like that, I'll show you somewhat of a ring form that you might use for a foot rim. There are other ways to think about the feet on these bowls. Um, you can look at the tube technique that's in the videos that I've put together for you. Um, you're going to have to use that eventually. Um, so why not open that up now also? The tube technique, uh, again, look at it. It's a way to make a uh, tube, any diameter, whatever you can find. I think I use a Pringles can in, in one. This is just a, a smaller tube. And let me show you how you can cut a foot rim off of a tube. And you can cut a bunch of foot rims with this process that would all be the same size. Um, so if you're looking at like doing a set, it might be something to think about. Okay, so if you have a tube, you see how it's uneven on top. Uh, it's pretty flat on the bottom. You want to get it flat first to do this. And if you use a ruler or a piece of wood, something that has a standard size, you can actually just uh, lay your X-Acto knife on it like this and uh, work it around the form. And just drawing a line first is the smart way, I think. Uh, if you try and cut it all at once, it doesn't work that well. But you see how the flat of the X-Acto knife lays on the flat of that board? This is just one way. Of course, you can measure from the bottom up in a whole bunch of places, then draw a line, but this just seems to be easiest. And then I'm going to put my blade into the clay, and I'm going to work the blade straight and flat, just like it was on the board. So I want a really straight uh, cut. And I'm going to slowly work it all the way around, making sure my blade's all the way through the clay too. And you can feel it once it, it cuts. Okay, so, um, so I ovalized this tube, so I have an oval foot rim. But here's a little foot ring. And I'll show you, I'm going to make a bunch of those and just show you on two how that works. Before I put it on a form, I may want to soften these edges first and just kind of rounding them out slightly. Talk about edges a few times now. And I'm just going to round those out and slowly sled with a, a moist but not wet finger or thumb. You can also use a rib and work it too. Uh, you can try your metal ribs, see how that works, and you can slowly round that out and uh, fix that before you go and put it on the bottom. Portions are something to think about. I made this foot a little larger to make a point that seems a little ridiculously large, but when it's flipped over, you can see how it gives it a different lift with that height. You see how it's got this lift 
And maybe that would be a focal point to do some piercing or something else. This is another example of a rather large foot. Again, you got to think about proportion. And it's not melded in. It's just scored and slipped and really fixed. The seam is fixed there, but it's not flowing out of it. If you want to actually make it kind of flow out of it, you're going to have to add a coil to that joint and move it back and forth. Here's an example of one with a foot that just is stuck on there and you can see that there's a joint very visible. If you want to meld that in, you can, after you put it on, add a coil and kind of round that out. Or if you like that kind of joint, you can leave it. This one is just showing it as a simple form on the bottom. When it's flipped over, you can see how the foot seats it, put it on a little bit of an angle to kind of play with it. Here's another example. This time I've actually cut out part of the form. You can see the line that goes all the way around the form. It's also nice to think about the foot in terms of cutting areas away of the foot. I mentioned how you could pierce through it but this is an example of doing a cutaway. Again, I'll kind of work that mouse hole. I'll work the edges and um, finish it off. And with all of these, I'll be working the lips a little bit further to either add stuff to the lip or to round them out. You can think about that lip as a starting point for some slab work. Okay, I've done enough to these to illuminate some ideas. How do you play with that lip? How do you play with that foot? That's going to be something that you get to decide. When you get into details, that's kind of the fun part. Okay, so remember, have some fun with these lips and the feet, and try and do some good drawings to illuminate ideas, and I can try and help you out with the surfaces and forms. Okay, dive on in.